This is Eleanor Otto. It would be an understatement to say the impact she's had on my generation is immeasurable. She is one of the last living Rosie the Riveters. You might remember the recruiting poster. Yeah, that one. My name is Abigail Spittler. That's me in the dress uniform. I am a cadet in Civil Air Patrol, aiming to be a pilot in the Air Force. It was my great pleasure to interview Eleanor at the March Air Museum in Riverside, California. Can you paint us a picture of what life, what your life specifically was like prior to the war? It was just a normal life, just uh, going to school, getting married, and working, different jobs. Um, I worked in the office, typing. You probably maybe heard of a typewriter? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I used to type, and I got bored with that, because you had to sit down a lot, and you know, I didn't like that. So I got up and did other things like uh, car hopping. Maybe you don't, she don't remember that. Car hopping, bringing food to cars, because that get me going where I can walk around and you know feel free and exercise. So that was good, and things like that. And some waitress working some waitress restaurants. Everything to be on my feet. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right before the war, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, where were you and what was the atmosphere like when you heard of it and what, were, what was people's reactions? I was in Santa Monica with my stepdad and mom. We were driving up and down Santa Monica Boulevard looking for a place to have breakfast. Huh. Eight o'clock in the morning came over the radio. Pearl Harbor was just bombed. And my stepdad, who's a chief naval officer, he said, don't worry, we're not going to have a war. You know, <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> then later on, of course, Roosevelt came on mm -hmm. the radio. This day will live in infamy and all that. And uh, things started to change right away. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, things were different. Uh, although we have no technology then or anything, but people all of a sudden just got together. They just got together and tried to do everything they could. And the military, of course, we were worried they were leaving to, to go to war and all that, and all the things we heard about Pearl Harbor. It was not a very exciting time, I'll tell you. Not that time, no. It was very sad. People lost a lot of, a lot of people. You know, right. In the war. After Pearl Harbor, how yeah. long after that did you start looking and seeing that women were going into aviation and riveting? And what was your transition into that? They were advertising for women because the men were going off to war and they needed the airplanes built as fast as they could get them. So we went and applied and just got hired just like that. And there was no time for school to teach us anything. So we had lead men, they had experience in airplanes. And so they taught us how to, well, how to do these jobs. Right. At first the men were kind of resented working with women, you know, thinking they couldn't smoke or couldn't take their shirts off or whatever in the summertime. But finally, when they saw that we cooperated and did everything they told us to do, we all got along real great and got the planes out on schedule. That's what the main thing was, get planes out on schedule. Mm -hmm. Was your family, uh, I guess, supportive of your decision to go into a job like that? Oh yes, very much. I thought it was just great. Something different, you know. Right. We was using men's tools, using how to use them and everything, and it was great because before we got the rivet gun, there was a, a machine that you put your thread on like a sewing machine. You put the rivet part in there and then stamped it down. I saw that in the museum recently. They still had that in some museum before the rivet gun came. So it was easier with the rivet gun, actually. You could go on different places, you know. Throughout your lifetime, how have you seen the world change? It's changed very much. They say that we paved the way for women. I, I've sat at lunch with CEO women in big organizations, and they thanked us for doing that because now they get all these wonderful jobs, and then I was with some uh, female pilots. One time I said, I will not find an airplane with a woman pilot. The best one of five, they came and told me, you just did. 
Oh, that was the best flight I ever had. <laughs> so that changed me completely. I felt like a baby chauvinist. <laughs> but they were wonderful, just wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, I see the technology of the young generation, because we didn't have all these all this technology in those days. We just had to do what we had to do with what the material we had. Right, definitely. Yeah, so uh, this is going to be a, 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 whole, a rosy, a new rosy technology. Mm -hmm. And you're a part of the program, the Spirit of 45. Tell oh, us uh, about I, that. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we have to keep that in each, each generation that they won't forget what happened in 1945 that the war ended mm -hmm. and changed the world and changed women and men working together and women being respected in any kind of job. You know, that, uh, there was not that kind of respect in my day when I first started. Right. They didn't think we could do very much. That's why we just did the little jobs we did. It's a beautiful thing to, to remember 1945. I didn't, when I was in school, uh, our history books were very interesting because they just mentioned this happened in 1911, this happened in 1889, just a bunch of uh, years. And so now, with the knowledge going on, people are learning uh, with the technology of the computer and movies, and they can learn faster that way. You right. know, about history. Yeah. And it seems like the younger generation is enjoying history more. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that they, after all these years, they're thinking of the Rosies and the women that went to work. We didn't think about all these years. It was never a thought in our mind that we did anything. Yeah, we worked during the war, uh-huh, that's what we said. You know, uh-huh, big deal. Now all of a sudden, it's a big deal. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, we're so thrilled about it. We are. I mean, the Rosies are just so happy about all the attention and, and appreciation and respect that we get. We are. Mm -hmm. After the war, when men started coming back, yes. uh, and obviously maybe wanting their jobs back as riveters, uh, how did you stay in that and work as long as you did? Within days, they laid us off. But we didn't care because we knew it would happen. We were there for a short time to do what we had to do, but we didn't think it was important until 70 years later. I mean, they didn't tell us we did anything good. We, we just said goodbye, thank you, and all that, and knew that we were so happy that the men came back and got their jobs back. We were the ones that came, they were lucky enough to come back. We were so happy for them, and we didn't care that they let us off. We, we just took it for granted it would happen anyway. You know, that's what it's supposed to be. So, I don't know, it just... <laughs> anyway, yeah. it was a sad time. What are you excited for, for young women and aviation? I won't be around, but looking forward to that, the technology. Uh, I want all the young people to learn all the top technology jobs and you'll all be having a good life, you know. Study engineering, uh, what do you want to do in aviation, or and top jobs they have now. Because women are welcomed in any industry. Right. Which is incredible because. It is incredible. I can't believe this is happening. Right. And I'm so happy I'm still living to see it all. Such big changes. You know, I buy day, oh my goodness, what a difference. What a difference. <laughs> yeah. What advice? would you give to young women today that are looking into aviation or engineering or well, just, just follow your dream don't let anybody talk you out of it just keep studying and you will be so proud of yourself your family will be so proud of you and the world will be so proud of you which they are now I, I, I'm so proud of this younger generation they're so intelligent and I used to have be interviewed by little kids and they say what did you do in your day you didn't have television, you didn't have, <laughs> you didn't have computers, you didn't have a phone, you didn't, how, what, hey, what? I said, we socialized. I said, <laughs> people were more important than machines in those days. <laughs> Civil Air Patrol is here, and some of the cadets 
that are in this program and see a future for themselves in at the Air Force or aerospace or any aeronautical engineering, what advice would you give specifically to them? Oh my, I can't believe it. I'm so proud of all these women. They can do anything. They can. We couldn't. We didn't have the opportunity. They wouldn't let us anyway. You know, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that. But now, in this generation, they've proven themselves. And I'm still willing to see it. And I'm so glad. I'm so proud of all these women. So proud. I, I have a question. <laughs> Look at this little girl here. <laughs> Did you and all the other Rosies dry, dress like that iconic poster we no. know so well? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why I hate to wear those things. Uh, you mentioned the C-17 plane that you got to fly Ooh. in. How was that? Oh, that was the best day of my life. <laughs> we, we worked on it for 24 years. We built 279 of them. So when I got the chance to, when they gave me that Lifetime Achievement Award, the Air Force, they said, how would you like to fly in a C-17? Oh my God, it was just so wonderful. Like sitting in your living room, no turbulence, it was just so nice. And all of a sudden, we landed, and I didn't even feel like we landed. We're on the ground, how'd we get here? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no, no there's, it's just a beautiful plane. Four hours in the air we had. It was just great. I'll never forget it. I was on cloud nine. I think I still am. <laughs> yeah. That sounds incredible. And especially... Oh, you love it. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned in one of my interviews that I, I, I give credit to all the co-workers I had because they worked hard. We all worked hard in that plane. It was a lot of work because at first, when I started working, we just had little small rivet guns because the rivets were small and the material wasn't very thick like the C-17 is. So there was no pressure on them. So then when the C-17 came, we had bigger rivet guns and thicker material and, you know, it's just uh, different technology now, stronger technology. Yeah. And harder technology. <laughs> it's harder Definitely. Than it used to be, yes. This is Chief Master Sergeant Joe Keller, a modern-day Rosie the Riveter. Uh, air medical evacuation here at March. I did that for 22 years. It was a very rewarding job because when we would deploy, we'd be there to pick up the wounded military and DOD civilians. And we, our faces would bring hope. Uh, they'd look at our faces and all you can see the smiles and stuff because they knew when we arrived, when the back of the plane would open and we'd get off, they knew we were bringing them back home. So we would cook them uh, chocolate chip cookies and make them hot dogs. It helped them be comfortable and be happy on the way, on the way home. So, so you, you flew on the C-17s then? C-17 is one of the many aircraft that I flew on and one of the newest aircraft, which provided a lot more room and it was a lot more comfortable to be able to bring uh, patients in. But yes, we've also flown another one. 35 also has capacity to be patients. Flown another 130. This also, although not designated for medical evacuation, could provide that transportation if needed in a pinch. So we brought patients back in KC-10s and C-5s as well. Very cool. So some of the neat things about the C-17 is that it could go and land in an austere landing strip on a very short dirt landing strip and it could land and it could turn on a dime and it's ready there to pick up troops and, and patients at a moment's notice. So it's an amazing aircraft so I'm so happy that Rosie the Riveter is here to enjoy a product of her hard work. If anyone has any questions out in the audience. Yes. Yeah. No. How did you feel when the war was finally over? Everybody was so taken. The streets were filled with people. People ran all over the streets kissing each other and everything. It was a madhouse. Oh yeah, people, and especially the military, of course. But it was wonderful. No, it, it was a great time when the war was over. People were crying yelling, just every way of celebration you can think of.
Yes. How long did it take you to make a plane? For all of us together, it takes a lot of people to make a plane. A whole lot of people. No, it takes uh, months, or maybe two or three months. Technology, it was easier then. The planes were easier to work on than they are now. Mm -hmm. You know, smaller rivet guns, less pressure, just thin material. How old were you when you went to work in the aircraft industry? Uh, let's see, 22, I think, 22, something like that. Yeah. Thank you. I work. I built airplanes for 68 years. Wow. People think that's nuts, but <laughs> I like it. You can't understand why I did that. <laughs> you liked it. But I enjoyed it. I did because you're around uh, people. I like to get up, and get out of the house. Even now, I'm retired. Not retired. I did not retire. I was laid off <laughs> because they closed the plant down. That's it. See, I never want to say retired. I never, I never would have. They would have forced me to. <laughs> and you're such an active woman today. You, yeah. you don't like sitting at home. You, no. You like going out and being a part. Yes, I do. At my age, 98, I am so grateful that I can still get out and walk and inspire people, like they say. So I don't know why, but I, I'm so grateful. God has been good to me, really. And I, I just love everybody. Everybody's been so kind. All, all you people, beautiful people that are smiling. I love you all. I do. We're so inspired by you. I mean, you and your generation had the confidence to step out and do something new. And uh, I think that that's really a backbone for people yeah. today and yeah. being able to step out of their comfort zone and do something new. And Oh, I'm so glad we did. Yeah. We were so happy to do that. At first, you know, it was difficult, but the men were real nice. At first they were kind of, you know, they weren't sure. They had never worked with women. <laughs> so, of course, when we got in there, well, pretty soon we became all good friends. We were good friends and, and did the job that we were supposed to do, that we was hired for. So, we, we, it, was, it was good. Are one of the planes you worked on here at the museum? No. No, I worked on the P-38. Okay. That was my favorite plane, the P-38. There's one outside. You have that? Yes, it's outside. Oh, you do? <laughs> Oh, that's my favorite plane. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to go see your favorite plane right now? Yeah. Okay. While all the girls are in their favorite cocktail bar, seven dry martinis munching caviar, there's a girl who's really putting them to shame. Rosie. Rosie is her name. All day long, whether rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, brrr, the riveter, keeps short lookout for sabotage. Sitting up there on the fuselage, that little fellow can do more than a milk can do. Rosie, brrr, the riveter. Rosie's got a boyfriend, Charlie. Charlie, he's a Marine. Rosie is protecting Charlie, working overtime on the riveting machine. When they gave her a production knee, she was as proud as a girl could be. There's something true about red, white, and blue about Rosie, the riveter.